we are living in a very strange world. Everything is changing so fast. cannot arrange programs like this if there are not good enough sponsors and partners and other patrons. So really, from the bottom of all of our heart, uh, I thank IPDC for giving us this support and this platform. And I welcome the Managing Director and CEO of IPDC <laughs> to, to bless us with his words and with his experiences. Thank you, Omen Pari. Thank you, Dr. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Everybody fine? Yes. yes. Good lunch? Yes. Now, good sleep? Post <laughs> lunch? Yeah? Good. So, as John Maya said, I am Mohamedul Islam, Managing Director of IPTC Finance. So, do all of us have idea about what is for industrial revolution? Don't know that. Okay. So we'll learn about that. But before that, I want to confess today, I am not fully prepared for this session. Because we are living in a very strange world. Everything is changing so fast. Faster than any time in the history of mankind. So, whatever I have learned, every day that is getting a little, little bit obsolete. So, whatever will be heading here may get irrelevant uh, by the time we end listen. So, jokes apart, we, we have, this is a vast talk. This is changing our everyday life. The way we want, not only that, what we are as a human being, that is also getting changed. So this topic needs a uh, time, most probably a day or a couple of days, but the aim of today's session of mine is not to really give you the full detail of how you learn and acquire the skills for the time ahead, but rather give you some context whereby your curiosity is ignited and you start being aware of the situation going around you, you start learning, you start preparing yourself for what is coming next. That is the fourth industrial revolution. So I give my introduction, but as there are so many of you, it's a little bit difficult to really get to know each of you, but we can just get some sampling. So how many of you are you still in your universities or in any educational institute? Can you raise your hand? So most of you are in your studies. Okay, please. And then how many of you are in your own business or something you are doing yourself? Okay, great. So there are some entrepreneurs here as well. And how many of us are in, uh, say, less than five years in job? Okay. Quite a few. And then more than five years? <coughs> uh, still quite a few. So basically, this is not only for those people who will be studying their job tomorrow, but it is also, it is relevant to people like us who started their job 18 years back, or 20 years back, or 10 years back. So how many of you have written a love letter, have written a love letter in your life? Oh, many of you, many of you. So now, not everything has changed. I come, I come. Uh, things are still so rapidly, we have forgotten to really write letters. <laughs> so only we, we do official correspondence. Okay. So, could we got some help for how, how our uh, attendees are uh, 
distributor. So let's get into some context uh, by which we can understand uh, what is called industrial revolution and how we need to really prepare for that. So what we have also seen, and we know these guys, our ancestors, okay, the early homo sapiens, the hunter gatherers. So these people have completely different life with us. They used to really hunt or gather uh, the fruits and other other food items around, not actively designing the production process. And this was really a, an egalitarian society. Whatever they used to get, they used to really share equally within the tribe. And one thing they used to do very frequently, they used to fight a lot with other tribes, okay? Often for women, often for food. But I say, if we consider if there was the same kind of mortality rate by the act of warfare, then in 20th century, there were 200 pro people dead because of warfare. So we have progressed a lot. So then, you see, there is something strange happened. People thought hunting is very difficult and dangerous. So they started to do something easier. They started designing the production, food production process. So that is agriculture. And that brought in a lot of change in society, uh, in family, uh, in the way they used to live. So basically, the, the people are mostly nomadic at that time. And basically, then they used to settle in a certain place. They used to acquire wealth because there was no work. Then the family concept came in. Uh, the division of work came in. The income equality came in because some smarter guy took control over the source of water. They employed smarter labor into their fields and they tried to accumulate more assets and wealth. So every change in human society, in the kind of production system, has also changed profoundly the way society is, how the political system is organized, uh, how the technology is organized, and how we, how we work to produce the essentials, and sometimes the non-essentials as well. So from there, basically, uh, from the homo sapiens for around 85,000 years, or at the hunter levels. Today, only very few in distant uh, islands in the Andaman Sea, there are few tribes still in the hunting hunter weather. Otherwise, people are in other profession. Then, if you look at the world population today, less than 10 percent. In countries like America, it's less than 3 percent engaged in agriculture. So, after say around 15,000 years, agriculture, which was mainly this feudalist society, the society again get changed because of another revolution that was the first industrial revolution. So what happened then? The steam engine was invented. So the production system got a huge booster and society, the economic model, the political system also got changed. From a feudalist system, we transform into a capitalistic system. The role of religious institute in say this political system got reduced. We saw more income equality, inequality, but we saw also the rise of meritocracy. People with their own effort coming out of the situation they are in and trying to really make their own fortune. And this, this has profoundly changed uh, the way we live in the society, our relationship, and also the way information is shared, produced, and distributed.
So with the invention of printing machine, the first industrial era, so the production, distribution, and consumption of information also got rapidly changed. Okay. So previously it was like the religious books or some uh, these uh, uh, books like uh, this Gilead, the Homer, or Greek tragedies, which had profound influence over the human kind over the years, the longest one. But with the invention of this printing press, information became much available, but much pervasive and very cost -changing. But then, in 19, late 1930s, we saw another change with the invention of electricity and mass production line, the corporate, the modern corporate started to evolve with mass production system and global rates for consumption. Then in the late 60s or early 70s, you saw the coming up of this computer and internet that is we call the information era, where the new generation came in and information became much more available. We saw the rise of knowledge worker world war. And we also saw that more people are involved into non-productive, not related to ultimate agriculture or manufacturing, but something different. Okay? So in agricultural society, most of them were engaged in production system, production of food, clothes, sweater, and many other equipment and accessories for the society. In industrial revolution, still most of the people were involved into uh, the production system, except for very few intellectuals. But in the information era, the third industrial revolution, we saw the rise of knowledge workers who are not actively engaged in the production system, not in agriculture, not in manufacturing. And then, the starting from 2015, we are seeing the rise of fourth industrial revolution, mainly led by artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, big data, machine learning, or trust. This is going to change the world more profoundly than any other previous changes. The change is more pervasive and faster, faster than any time else in the history. And that is not only going to change how we work, how we manufacture or cultivate, this is also going to change who we are as human beings. Watch a small video about the fourth industrial revolution.
the basic difference uh, from the first, second, third industrial revolution uh, in the, uh, the fourth war is that previously also there was artificial labor okay, from the base, which was not humanity or any other living animals who were involved into uh, this production system. But there were machines as well, which was artificial labor, helping us to do the most difficult physical or mental work. But now, for the first time, machine is also having intelligence. That is a major difference. So first, first characteristic of this uh, fourth industrial revolution is the artificial intelligence and some related topics like machine learning, big data, internet of the blockchain, and then there are some other areas of technology which involve directly like neuroscience, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and few others. And this, this is reshaping us so rapidly that what we are going to see tomorrow getting totally unpredictable.
the societal structure, the political form, and as well as the human beings. So one, one key question now, the key intellectuals in the world are asking, the technology bringing in more inequality in the society, jobs are getting displaced or net loss, uh, there are moral questions about what should be done or not done using the kind of technology of biotechnology or neuroscience, what kind of intervention will be accepted to human body or human mind, or how the big influence of corporates will impact the national boundaries going forward. Companies like Apple, Google, Facebook has much more GDPs, a much more economic power than most of the countries of the world. And this is going to happen. And they are bringing new culture. They are influencing the generation and consumption of information and building the public opinion more efficiently, more pervasively than the country's uh, authority can do. So this is, these are big questions. How the society will look like tomorrow and how we ourselves can prepare for that kind of situation. So there is enormous opportunities. You can really harness by preparing yourself for this era. Again, there are also huge challenges for you to have the kind of competitivity that is required to really effectively combat the challenges posed by these radical changes in our ecosystem. So this is this is a very uh, this uh, article was published just uh, say few months back. Google's artificial artificially intelligent uh, this machine, the AlphaGo, has beaten the best Go player in the world. Go is the world kind of this is a uh, more complex version of change. So it requires a huge uh, logical uh, uh, strength and uh, algorithms to really play there. And for the first time in the history, uh, the machine has beaten human beings in the game of Go. And this machine was used the deep learning machine was given a huge data, big data, and using the data, they learn and relearn and refine their decision making with, with the new experiences. So, if you just remember, so we were from in 1998, was from the IBM, Deep Blue defeated the world's uh, the best uh, chess player Yes, it has grown at that time in change. The Go is much more complex game than uh, this change. It is much difficult to learn. So, basically, every year, they need much more power than the previous one. So, it's only a mission. Enjoy it. And this is more scary and more profound, this, this technological change. US first scientists get in genomes of human embryos. So what they have done, they have changed a certain DNA in the human embryo by which there was a danger or the possibility of this heart disease. So heart disease or the cancer or diabetes, these are often genetical diseases. And they have changed the DNA sequence in a way they detected which which gene causes this disease that they have detected. Very soon we'll see companies giving advertisement that you want a disease-free child, six feet tall, fair and handsome, come to us, one million dollars. We will do all the genome sequence. 
that be good for the society? Will that be permissible? That only the richest can afford those technologies? These are moral questions. These are the ethical questions that are we are facing now. We will be facing tomorrow. Robots and 
artificial intelligent machines, but there are jobs which will be here for some time. But eventually, by next 125 years, all the jobs can be done by artificially intelligent machines. So then there are some books you can read like uh, this uh, super intelligence like Nick, Nick Bostrom and the master of algorithm by Pedro Dominguez. So this that will give you some understanding how the world is going to change and what does that mean uh, for us as human beings, uh, what does that mean as the society and how we have to better prepare for the technological change. We need not to give them a free life to change everything around us. So, so this kind of technology, the artificial intelligence, bitcoins, uh, blockchains, machine learning, GD printing, all are getting invented in countries like the USA, uh, then Europe. So we are far away from the epicenter of this discovery. So does that mean we are saying and our world our country is not going to change. It took few, so hundred years to really come the steam engine to our country after it was invented. But you think how much time it took to really come the Facebook to Bangladesh. So now the change is rapidly being replicated, communicated, and used by country like us. And our world is getting changed as well. So this is this is this is the situation. So the right the the, the this the sponsor of the company called Tesla, the founder of Tesla, which is making the this autopilot system in the car, so auto auto driving vehicles. And we are thinking about something different. So that is a vast change. But this is not that to ridicule the person we have in Bangladesh. But he, he has his power. This group of people who, whom he represents, they are vulnerable to this technological invention. They, they will lose jobs. The modern society wants more accountable, uh, more learned drivers, and most of the technology also making complete removal of the drivers from the vehicle. Very soon we'll see many countries only having these self-driven vehicles. So what do we do? Do we welcome that vehicles in Bangladesh, or we say then? Our people will lose job initial thinking skills quite. So those of you are into science, technology, engineering and mathematics, they have a better future. Also the marketing professionals have better future. Then as I say, there is a growing aging population across the world and this is going to get more prevalent. So this aging society will need caregivers. So if you are in caregiving profession, you are going to find life much more easier. And there are sales marketing specialists and customer service representatives that is also going to grow. Then social intelligence and new media literacy. So it's not the traditional media literacy. This is the new media literacy, the digital media that is going to be important. Teachers and trainers like our brother Don Sander, their job will be growing because things will be changing so fast. You will need to really relearn every few years because the kind of one directional learning that you will learn in the school, college, and universities, and you will join in a profession and you know learning, that days are over. You need to continuously learn and you have to get back to the teachers and trainers. 
management analysts, accountants, and auditors will see double digit job. Adaptability and business acumen will be the desired skills. And top 10 jobs in 2030 body part makers. There will be people who will be making new hearts, legs, uh, for that, that will be told that this is for the athletes or the uh, working teams, but most probably healthy people will be also trying to get advantage of this. That okay, I don't like my nose, let me change it, or I am a smoker, let me change my lungs. So like that, nanomedics. So the nanotechnology bringing some very advanced uh, technology related to our disease and the human body control, that will be So these are jobs, these are still not very prevalent currently, but these are the jobs which is going to come in the next 15 years. There are few very interesting ones, new science ethicist. I do not know how many of you in our here from psychology or philosophy background. They will see rise in their job because the kind of technological change will require to fundamentally think what is the bound of our morality or ethics. Competition need to really hire more psychology, psychology and philosophy background people to make a more rational system looking at the uh, the kind of influence that we have on the society and the human resource uh, themselves. It is not only the business graduate who will dictate the decision because money will not be the only decision, only influence here for business. It is also there will be highly uh, controlled those, those companies who are into the advanced technology segment, they will be highly monitor to see whether their operation, their conduct is done ethically and morally sound way. What benefit this new technology will bring to the overall society or whether this is going to only benefit few of the rich or the company itself but for overall society this is going to bring in some kind of disaster. The climate change reversal specialist and uh, so this is something that we have, we have already destroyed large of the ecosystem. This is going to be worse in the next 10, 15 years. But there is also reversal process going to come. So this kind of job, you need to really think 10, 15 years from now. Those who are still student, most probably will be mid-career in 2030 or 35. You need to think ahead. So the most important skill for you is the cognitive skill. What is cognitive skill? That is the thinking ability. How we gather information, how we read, how we listen, memorize and analyze information and process it to make a sound decision. So it is like a processor of a computer system. And then the processor may have different kind of applications like Microsoft Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, which are like the skills, you are an engineer or doctor, but the basic mental capability is your cognitive skill. That you have to really give the basis of how you can improve your cognitive skill. How you can really make sure that as the situation is changing, your cognitive skill gives you better adaptability with the new situation and you can learn first. So, what are the eight core cognitive capacities? This is sustained attention. So, few of you have lost your attention already, but few of you are still very attentive. So, this is a very important skill. The response inhibition, there is always some distraction. Somebody, somewhere will be doing this or Whether you can really restrict those kind of distraction. The speed of information processing, how fast we can process the new information we are receiving. The multiple simultaneous attention. So the world is so complex that we cannot really be attentive to one singular 
the issues or parts we are all past teachers current professional world. Then working memory, how my current memory is working. So there is the permanent memory and this is also working memory which is your short term memory. It's like RAM in computer. Then cognitive flexibility. I am flexible, I, I can adapt to new situations or I, I have a set idea, set belief and set processing. So it was Windows 1995, but now it's something completely different. So whether the human being, that is called neuroplasticity, you can always learn new things in which age you are, doesn't really matter. The category of information, so certain kind of information, bulk of information you are receiving every day. Whether you can really select which are the information most relevant to you. And that is also relevant to pattern recognition. From a quick data, whether we can see some kind of pattern, whether I can see from this room, whether there is some pattern that, okay, I, I see there is a prevalence of wearing black in the audience. That may be influenced by our organizer, Mr. Tom Sandani, and he's here. Yeah. But that, that may be a pattern which may be rational or which may be to completely uh, perception. But we need to see that. Okay? So the good thing is these are all the skills, which means this can be developed, this can be improved with conscious effort. You need not do any inheriting. So there are eight habits which can really lead you to better cognitive skills. <coughs> like physical activity, like openness to experience, it's not something very soothing experience, but you need to get exposed to challenging experience consistent basis to really develop your thinking is your brain when challenged will really improve its capacity. That's neural plasticity. It's not like computer. That is a set processing capability. This 2.3 megahertz, gigahertz, and then it can really change. But human brain can really adapt and it can improve. It can really expand its capacity of processing. Then curiosity and creativity. So the modern life with the hard work brings in lots of stress. So to make a good decision, you have to remember about the stress. The stress, persistent stress, uh, basically creates a hormone called uh, cortisol that really is inhibited to make sound decision. So then you need to learn how to remember. So these are things. We, we have to make sure the meditation, the kind of sleep, uh, the reduce chronic stress, these are the way we can build our cognitive skills. And basically, one thing we have to understand that I am saying the world is changing so fast. Our career length is increasing, but the skills that, that is called the half life of the skills. By the time the skill we have acquired, 50% of it gets uh, outdated is now only five years. So every five years you need to really remodel yourself. So that is what you need to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Every day or every day I spend more than two hours in learning in my days. So for you it should be more than that. Okay? So when do I Learn. When do I read? When I travel with my car, before I sleep, and I utilize my weekends as So unless you learn, you cannot really be successful. And not only learning, you have to also learn how to unlearn. That is the difficult part. You learn something which is no more effective or relevant at this point. So you need to learn how to and learn what you learn. So, there will be few things in life that will not change. That is what it is perseverance, the hard work. Yes. Most of, the, most of you have come here to learn something which will 
make your life easy. You will find some shortcut to make success in life. Not actual. There is no shortcut to hard work. So you will have to work hard. But that makes your life stressful. The motive is to be more happy, less stressful. The objective is to really have a good life, happy life, enjoyable life, not work. But how how you make sure you work hard and not get stressed? That is the key question. So Papa Vikas was asked, how long you work every day? He said 16 hours. And the interviewer was shocked. You work 16 hours and when do you relax? He said, I relax only when I work. Okay? So you have to have the passion. You, so your work should be your passion. You choose your career. Where? Your passion is. Don't get into everything. Don't go for the material benefit to choose a job. You will fail. But go for something for your passion. So first one perseverance, second one passion, and the there is a third one. That is purpose. Okay? So as a human being, what is the aim in our life? To become happy? Somebody says, in the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is the ultimate objective of life. It's not happiness. It is. Life is the accumulation of some experience you create for others. If you create positive experience for others, we make a meaningful life. That should be the purpose of life. So, first one, perseverance. Second one, passion. And third one, purpose. That will be essential for any situation, whatever the technological change, whatever the industrial revolution we see. That we call the quality, the skill of the CEO. So in IPDC, we are going very fast. We are only 100 people at the end of 2015. By one and a half years, we are almost 500 people. But how, how do we retain the kind of hunger, passion, and purpose? I say, we do not have only one CEO in IPDC. I say we can be enormously successful only when each one of us, from our security guard, from the management trainees, from the people in the mid management to the top level, everybody thinks like the CEO. That is, that is how we become successful. That is how you can really be successful within any change. And that is how the organization can have exponential growth in its journey towards making a meaningful difference in the life of people itself. Thank you. What a wonderful speech in, you know, back to it, a lot of facts and figures, and then he had a nice flow. It, it was very informative. Uh, you know, the best part of the presentation, the best part of the presentation was the fact that trainers' jobs will increase. <laughs> oh no! Uh, even Pashawal was saying the same thing. Training. Uh, please, guys, you you know talented people like you shouldn't come here. So before. Mediocre people like me. <laughs> the most talented, the most talented people should get into teaching others. Okay, to share. So the kind of monolithic career. Twenty-three years say you will start a job, and sixty-five years say or sixty years will 
Thank you. Thank you.